What's up, everybody? Jackson Fuller here, and you are listening to the latest episode of Hog and the Mic, and it is time to preview the upcoming football season for the Arkansas Razorbacks. We will bring Andrew Hutchinson in in a second to get this show on the road. We're going to talk a lot of uh, different topics today, uh, you know, final records, some offensive, defensive MVPs. We'll try and see what we both think about uh, Sam Pittman's future with the team, but some other fun categories, too, to try and, uh, you know, just see who we like from this team, what we like from this team, and perhaps maybe who and what we don't like about this Arkansas Razorbacks team. Uh, but the season is just a little more than a week away. We're recording this on Wednesday, August 21st, and uh, you should have it in your, uh, you know, podcast feeds on Thursday, just exactly one week before the Hogs make the trip to War Memorial Stadium to play UAPB. So without further ado, let's get to previewing. We'll play that rock music, bring Hutch in, and get this episode of Hog and the Mic started. Hutch, uh, how's it going? Uh, one week away, man. Does it feel real yet that uh, football season is really upon us right now? Yeah, it's starting to feel like football season. I, I stepped outside this morning to take my girls to daycare, and it was 65 degrees. Like, it almost had a little chill in the air. And I was like, that was my first thought was, it's football season, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yesterday I went uh, to Dixon Street to a coffee shop to work and I actually sat down outside to work and, and enjoy the, you know, I think it was like 70 degrees all morning. It's a uh, man, nothing gets Jackson Fuller fired up more like fall weather. When we get closer to hoodies and shorts weather, uh, that uh, and that usually coincides with the good time of football season. So uh, it's, it's a good time to, to be alive right now in Northwest Arkansas, although I'm sure the summer is going to make a reappearance here, but not before too long. So uh, Hutch, this is our preview pod, and uh, we're going to talk all things Arkansas for the 2024 season, uh, make some predictions. Um, but before we do, Fall camp wrapped up uh, last week, I guess, when we last recorded was technically the last practice of fall camp, but they've been going a little bit with some closed practices since then. I guess they had a couple of other open practices as well. You know, based off all the action that we've seen, that talking to the coaches, the players, you know, what we've heard, are you more positive, more negative, or about the same outlook with this Arkansas Razorback team uh, that you had before fall camp started? You know, I pro it's about the same, but I guess I could say it's a little bit more positive, but that's not because like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid or anything. It's because to be quite honest, my, my feelings on the team going into fall camp were pretty low. Uh, if we're being a hundred percent honest, uh, they've, they've made me feel a lot better about certain things. You know, like I, I'm, I'm no longer as concerned about the linebacker spot. Like I was going in, uh, sounds like Matthew Shipley is going to be a, a, a de at least a decent kicker. You know, there was some serious concerns there after the spring. Um, I, I think they're going to be okay at wide receiver as long as everyone stays healthy. Um, you know, offensive line, I'm still a little bit concerned, although Patrick Kudis, you know, according to Bobby Petrino the other night, uh, was is able to do some stuff at practice. Um, but I do, you know, maybe Marion Harris can fill in there. I think he's got a really high ceiling. Uh, so there, there's some things that make me feel a little bit better. Um, and we'll get into specific predictions later on, but I, I still am not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're going to compete for a spot in the college football playoff or even win eight games this year. But, uh, I, I do feel better about the team than I did coming in. And perhaps that's just the optimism that naturally comes as, as football season gets closer. Uh, I, I like that because I'm kind of the opposite where it's pretty much the same, but I am a little bit more negative about this team than I was before fall camp. Um, and it'll, it just, it all has to do with the offensive line. I think I, I think when we, when I talked about this team in the spring and in the summer, kind of building up to it, I really liked what I saw uh, in spring camp from the first five that, you know, starting unit. Um, and I think that Arkansas is pretty confident with those five, um, whether that's Patrick Kudis or a Marion Harris. But just hearing, you know, that the defensive line has kind of had their way with them throughout fall camp. I mean, Bobby Petrino made another reference to that yesterday uh, when we spoke to him uh, for his media availability. Um, and then the lack of depth there, we're going to get injuries at some point. Um, you know, if, those, if they have to replace one of the tackles and one of the guards in a road SEC game, 
I mean, I just, it's just such a difficult schedule. It's very, they have such a small margin for error at a lot of positions, but especially on the offensive line. And I think I was maybe a little bit higher on this team than other, other people coming into fall camp. Um, I still think they're, they're going to be better than maybe what some national guys and people outside the state of Arkansas think about this team. And and maybe even some fans inside the state who are so pessimistic, but uh, I definitely have my guard up that were one or two, you know, injuries or, you know, one player not living up to expectations away from it being a very, very similar season to last year. Um, and, you know, of course, time will only tell. And even with how bad last year was, they were pro- a couple breaks away from making it to another bowl game and six and six. While it's not great, sounds a lot better than four and eight. So, We'll see. Uh, I think a little bit lower myself, but not by some crazy amount. And uh, there has, like you said, there has been a lot of good to come out of fall camp, like the linebacker room, the wide receivers. Um, seems like Taylor Green's developing nicely. So a lot, a lot of good still, but I think that offensive line just really concerns me. Okay, let's get to some more fun categories. And we're going to start uh, – discussing maybe a couple of games in particular. Let's go with, you know, Arkansas has a tremendous home schedule this year, Hutch, uh, especially in the SEC. They have Tennessee, uh, LSU, Ole Miss, and Texas coming to Fayetteville. It's just a, a wonderful slate. It would be awesome if Arkansas is decent at all, and we get some great crowds uh, when those teams come to Fayetteville. Out of those four SEC games, which one at home is the best upset chance you think for Arkansas? Well, without revealing uh, some more of my predictions that we're going to discuss <laughs> later on, uh, I, I'll, for the sake of just kind of treating them all equal, I, I'd probably say LSU, um, just because one, it was a close game last year. Obviously, you can't look too much into that, um, and that was in you know at Death Valley. Uh, Arkansas and LSU, traditionally speaking, have been a, a close series. Uh, honestly, you could say the same thing about Ole Miss, probably even more so with Ole Miss. Um, but I, I just think Ole Miss is going to be really good this year. Uh, but I, So maybe maybe LSU. Um, I can't remember who they play before playing Arkansas. I don't know if there's some type of advantage there. I know historically Arkansas has gotten LSU after Alabama. Um, I don't know if that's the case this year, uh, but uh, I, I think it's, it's Ole Miss this year. They okay, play, so they play it, Ole Miss at home. So there we go. So maybe they, they, they beat Ole Miss in a, you know, emotional game or whatever, and Arkansas gets to kind of sneak up on them. So I, I think that LSU is the way to go there, but you could make a case for all of them, but I don't know if any of them are super like, oh, yeah, that's upset in the making right there. Yeah. LSU, uh, man, uh, they, their schedule, they'll play, they play South Alabama and then they get a bye and then they go home against Ole Miss at Arkansas at Texas A&M by home against Alabama. So like Arkansas out of those four games is the, is the one maybe LSU might uh, look a little bit past with a rivalry game against at Texas A&M and Alabama. I know Arkansas also a rivalry and probably even more of a rivalry than Texas A&M, despite the SEC deciding that LSU and Texas A&M should have been the last game of the season all in recent years. Uh, that's a conversation for another day, the, the rivalry pecking order in the SEC. I like that LSU pick, um, especially because they're coming off a bye. However, I think I'm going to go Tennessee um, because it's it's that first Fayetteville home game. And uh, I guess in my logic, I'm also giving Arkansas a better start to the season than people imagine. I just think if this team is somehow three and two at the worst, like has a winning record coming into that Tennessee game, the fans are going to turn out. Maybe I'm being optimistic with that, but I think, you know, that if they're three and two, that means that they've beaten one, excuse me, they've beaten one of Oklahoma State, Auburn or Texas A&M. Uh, I don't think the I don't think a lot of fans expect them to win any of those games. They're definitely going to be underdogs in all three of those games. So if they can win one of those games, be three and two, Tennessee coming to town, uh, it's going to be. I think it's it's either going to be an afternoon game or a night game. It's one of those flex. It's not going to be a morning game. It has some makings of a great environment and potentially an opportunity for Arkansas to showcase, you know, to a national audience like. Hey, uh, 
we still, you know, our fans are still behind us. We still have some juice here and we're, we're, you know, going to have a much better season than we did last year. I also think Tennessee uh, out of all those teams is probably the worst of the, those teams that are coming to Arkansas and they're still a great team going to be, you know, preseason, I think preseason top 15 at top 20 at least. But uh, I think I just like what those other teams have a little bit more. And uh, I, I would give the best shot at uh, Tennessee upset, but by no means a prediction this far out. Uh, we got a long way to go before we get there. All right, Hutch. Well, on the flip side of that, our next category, the road game that brings the most fear. Uh, I think we'll include Oklahoma State in this one, and we will also include uh, Texas A&M in Dallas because that just has felt like a road game uh, over the past decade when Arkansas goes there. So that brings it to at Oklahoma State, at Auburn, uh, versus Texas A&M in Dallas, and at Missouri, and I'm missing one, and at Mississippi State, sorry, and at Mississippi State. Out of those five, which uh, which road game strikes the most fear? Uh, whether you know that's a kind of a general question, but could be a fear of a blowout, of a surprise loss. Just which game kind of uh, gets your spidey senses tingling? Yeah, I was going to say it really kind of depends on how how you define fear, um, because you could look at it one way. It's like you know that Missouri game at the end of the year scares me, and that it could be it could be ugly theoretically. You know, if, if Arkansas has let go of the rope just like they did last year. And you know, Drinkwitz isn't going to take take it take it with his foot off the gas. Uh, and it's in Columbia; they could be playing for a spot in the college football playoff at that point because uh, they've got a absolutely cupcake schedule. If if y'all have not looked at Missouri's schedule yet, go look at it. It's ridiculously easy, um, and so that that could be ugly. So if that's the kind of how you define fear, go with that. But to me. The fear is that Mississippi State game, because that's going to be a game that everyone's like, okay, if you're going to win an SEC game, if they haven't to that point, there's going to be a ton of pressure. You know, I, I think that's it's before the second bye week, and, you know, Pittman, you know, his job could be on the line, and it could, you know, that, that could really, if the season isn't completely off the rails at that point, that could theoretically just make everything go kaput. And so... And that's a winnable game, a very, very winnable game in Starkville. Uh, so that that would maybe be my pick, just because of what could potentially be at stake uh, when that game rolls around. That was my runner-up. Uh, I think we're we're I'm kind of we're on the same wavelength, but I'm just veering off at the very end. I'm going Oklahoma State week two because I'm scared if you know there's a scenario where Oklahoma State blows them out in week two. And what does that do for this program An off season of talking about a culture change and all the players that are, they brought in and how they think this year is going to be different. And they figure, you know, they want, they feel like they have a good grasp on what exactly went wrong last year. If you go on the road to Oklahoma state, and I know they're a top 25 team, but if you get blown out like that, it's going to be a shot to the confidence before, you know, the sec games even arrive. Uh, I think BYU in a lot of ways did that to Arkansas last year. I know that was a home game, but it was their big non-conference game. And losing that game was kind of a shock to the confidence system for a lot of guys, coaches and players in the, on the, in the program. Um, and one thing it also bring kind of gives you some fear is that's kind of going to be the first huge, huge road game in a hostile environment for a lot of these players that have transferred in from some smaller schools, you know, like, uh, who was who were we talking to yesterday that that or recently this week uh, two guys that actually played against each other oh it was Anton Junkaj um and oh gosh now I'm forgetting yeah, anyways Robinson. he was and Marquise Robinson yeah uh talking about how they like Anton played against Marquise um uh, while he was at Baylor no I'm getting it all confused. Anyways, this is terrible podcasting, but you know, a lot of these players that are at that were at smaller schools, when they go to a bigger school, like yes, you're in a big big stadium, big environment, but it still doesn't have that feel of like SEC versus Big 12, state neighbors, huge, you know, huge matchup, going to be on ABC, sold out crowd. How do these guys respond to that? I'm not saying that they're going to be scared of the moment, but we haven't seen them in that moment. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how the likes of, you know, Taylor Green, some of the new linebackers, uh, you know, Cuddy has that experience from playing at Oklahoma State. But 
Uh, I'm just nervous about that game setting a bad tone for the rest of the season. Um, but on the flip side, if they were to win that game, man, there would be a lot of optimism flowing throughout, throughout Northwest Arkansas. Uh, all right, now we'll go to the next category here. And uh, best transfer. And Arkansas did a lot of work in the portal, uh, I think bringing in more than 20 guys. Of course, they had a lot to replace because of all the guys that left. But who do you think uh, is going to be the best uh, transfer that came in this offseason? Oh, you know, I could go di- many different ways. I think if he stays healthy, I think Jaquin and Jackson is going to have a really good year. Um, I think that's a, li- a notable if because we've seen him banged up a little bit during fall camp. Uh, I think he dealt with an ankle injury last year at Utah. Um, I think it was an ankle injury that he's been dealing with here. So you worry about that lingering. But if he can stay healthy, I think Jaquin and Jackson, uh, people are going to really like what they see out of him. Like, I don't know, I don't know if he'll run for a thousand yards or anything, uh, but I could see him being a very productive back and, and people that just really like, like his, the way he runs, the style he runs. He's a very physical back. Um, Although I don't think he likes that label necessarily. Um, I think he thinks he's also a shifty and speed back and everything. I think he has those skills too. But, you know, to throw in the physicality aspect, I think makes him a little bit more unique. So I, I really like what I see, I've seen out of Jaquindon since the spring. Great pick. I think he's uh, he's got to have a good year. If this team's going to be good, Jaquindon has to be one of the, you know, better running backs in the SEC. Um I'm going to go Xavier Sori. I think that he has kind of come in and he flew a little bit under the radar in the spring. He was the starting linebacker still, but, you know, there wasn't a lot of buzz about him. And this fall, it seems like he's definitely taken a step up. I think we talked about this last week. He's gained the coach's trust. The other players are kind of impressed with him. Um, after the first scrimmage, you know, I, I always love kind of reading too far into which players we get to talk to after practices and scrimmages and stuff. But, you know, after the first scrimmage, which was kind of, it felt like a split offense and defense both had their moments. We got Taylor Green, the face of the, you know, the offense, the new star transfer quarterback, and we got Xavier Sori. So that tells me that he's kind of, you know, going to be one of the pillars of this program this year. And, you know, he didn't really do much at Georgia, but he did get, at least he got two starts last season as a redshirt sophomore, you know, played in 11 games. Just to play at Georgia means they clearly see something in you, and he wanted to leave for you know more of a guaranteed starting role. Find that finds that here at Arkansas, I think he's going to be an impact player on the linebacker or on the defense and in the linebacker room. And really, the only thing that gives me hesitation with this pick is it feels like Arkansas has four or five linebackers they really like. But I think at the end of the day, sorry, you know, by far the highest recruit in that room, and uh, I think he's going to have a, a monster year. Are you? Are you feeling similar things with Sori? I know, you know, I might be kind of, you know, one of the few people that are kind of thinking that he's separating himself from the other linebackers. What's your read on the linebacker room right now, Hutch? I'm, I think you're exactly right. I think he separated himself. I think it was really telling uh, when, I think it was Sam Pittman a couple of weeks ago mentioned that when the the new headset thing system they have, the mics and the helmet and stuff, obviously Taylor Green's going to have it on offense. Well, who's going to have it on defense? Uh, it's a little bit trickier because there's more rotation. You know, the linebackers don't play 100% of the snaps. Um, but he said it's it's going to be their their middle linebacker, and that's going to be Xavier Sori. So that tells me, like, he's expected – he'll probably play more snaps than the other guys, you know, over Brad Spence and the other transfers and everybody. So I, I think he's, he's separated himself. And I worry that some people are maybe expecting a Drew Sanders-like – impact from him because like oh well this is another five-star linebacker who came from a powerhouse sec program and it's not quite the same uh this is a little bit different as you said he kind of flew under the radar a little bit in the spring uh drew sanders immediately i mean the first practice and, and i'm not a talent evaluator at all so don't don't get it confused but even i saw like drew sanders is a mm-hmm. dude he is going to be really really good and sure enough, he's second team All American and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if Xavier Sawyer is going to be quite that good, but there's nothing stopping him from being a very effective, good SEC linebacker for the Razorbacks. Yeah, good stuff. I, I think one thing, too, about the linebacker room, I think we're going to see 
um, like Xavier's going to be that like that guy in the middle, and then everyone else is going to they're going to use their versatility. You know, I think that that's something Arkansas coaches have done a good job recruiting in out of the transfer portal. You know, uh, Anthony Switzer is going to you know be the guy that can also maybe cover running backs and do a little bit in pass you know other pass coverage things. Uh, Brad Spence is going to play close to the line of scrimmage. You know, maybe even as that buck linebacker. Uh, you know, it seems like Steven Dix is that traditional linebacker. Maybe him and Sori are kind of the two traditional guys and everyone else has a variety of roles. Uh, regardless uh, whether Sori's the standout transfer or not, uh, I think the biggest, the, the best thing Arkansas coaches did all offseason was revamp that, that linebacker room and put it in a place where they can have some confidence going into the season. Uh, okay, up next, uh, we did, we talked best transfer. Let's go a different route, but the same theme of newcomers, best freshmen. And we're going to stick with true freshmen here, of course. Not too many options. Uh, Hutch knows who I'm going to pick. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you know who I'm going to pick. But uh, Hutch, who's your pick for best uh, true freshman this year? Well, because I know you'll be on the defensive side. I will uh, stay on the offensive side. And I'm going to go with C.J. Brown. Uh, the guys just really impressed me. Like, if you had asked me going into spring ball who who it would be, C.J. Brown probably wouldn't have even been in my top five uh, or top ten maybe I'm because I, I just I wasn't sure how good he was. He wasn't this super heralded guy, but all he's done is come in and run crisp routes and catch everything thrown to him and He's gotten a lot of reps with the ones while Tyrone Bro and Andrew Armstrong have dealt with, you know, various injuries. So that tells me he's going to get an opportunity and I think he's going to make the most of it. Uh, it's really cool to see a local kid from Bentonville getting that opportunity. Uh, so he he's my pick, although I will give an honorable mention kind of tip of the cap to Braylon Russell, uh, kind of going back to the, if Jaquin and Jackson can stay healthy angle, if he doesn't stay healthy, we could see a lot more Braylon Russell than we maybe expect uh, because as I think you mentioned it in the last podcast, you know, Coach Petrino kind of put Jaquindon and Braylon in the same kind of bucket with, you know, physical runners. Um, I think that if, if something did happen to Jaquindon, obviously Rashad Dabinia would get an uptick in, in carries, but I think it would trickle down into Braylon Russell getting more of an opportunity. I think he's going to play as a freshman. I just think C.J. Brown, uh, if everybody stays healthy, I think C.J. Brown's going to have a bigger impact. Yeah, would you would you say C.J. Brown's probably the f- fourth wide receiver on the pecking order right now? I think so. I mean, when they've had you know Andrew Armstrong and Isaiah Zatania, you know, back and you know doing the team stuff, the third receiver has been C.J. Brown. You know, it's, it's Tyrone Broden out, so it's not Tesla. It's not. Uh, Jaden Wilson, it's not Davion Dozier. The, those guys have gotten some some opportunities, but C.J. Brown has gotten more of them based on what we've seen. So I think he's number wide receiver four. He's definitely, I think, been the most steady wide receiver. You know, maybe uh, Satania, probably. But I, at, past those first three, I would definitely say C.J. Brown's been the most consistent performer spring to fall. Um, and it seems like Petrino knows how to use him. That's something Bobby said about Tesla is he's like, I'm still figuring out how to use him in the right ways. And you mentioned it could be a, as a red zone target is maybe his, uh, best attributes and how he's most used, but it seems like Bobby's got a pretty good grasp on, you know, the things that CJ does well and how he can use him in the offense. Uh, Anyways, yeah, I'm going Selman Bridges. Uh, I just I think that this guy is I, by like midway of the season is going to be a starting a starter for this team, um, and I, that's I mean if that happens, that's going to be really tough for some of the other cornerbacks on the roster like Jaheim Singletary, Cuddy Robinson, you know Keon Stewart. But uh, I, I think this guy's talent is there. He's just got to learn the system, learn college football, and he will be probably the second best cornerback on this team by the end of the season. Uh, I've, I've been that impressed with him, but I like your Braylon Russell shout. I agree. I think if like maybe early in the season, no, but by the time we get to like SEC play, if um, you know, Jaquindon Jackson has to miss a game, I would, I would bet that, Braylon Russell leads the team in carries in a game that Jaquindon Jackson misses more so than Dominion, just because bigger, more powerful guy in between the tackles, Dominion will get his fair share of touches and maybe carries plus catches combined. It's Dominion, but strictly carries. I think it would be Braylon Russell replacing uh, Jaquindon Jackson, which, you know what? Credit to this, these, this staff in 
they're, you know, they didn't have a like highly ranked recruiting class, but it seems like they definitely got some guys to come in that are, could be impact players for multiple years. So uh, they get the, the staff gets crapped on a bunch for the recruiting and in some ways, rightfully so, but at least when they they're, they're hitting on some of their targets and under the radar guys. All right. Uh, what we got next here? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I like this question a lot. <laughs> Who leads the team in receiving yards? It's our, like our one statistical category I'm going to go with, but I think this is by far the most interesting uh, like position on the roster to see how the pecking order shakes out because, I mean, you could answer any of the three top receivers here and I wouldn't, uh, you know, have too much of a gripe. And you could even throw in Luke Haas, a tight end here, and I, I wouldn't complain too much. But Hutch, uh, who, who's going to lead this team in receiving yards? Yeah, I was going to say you could choose any of those four guys. Um, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'm going to make the easy choice, Andrew Armstrong. I think there's just been so much hype around you know Tyrone Broden's improvement, which I think is legitimate. I think he's been you know phenomenal, huge strides. I think uh, Isaiah Satania. I'm the biggest Isaiah Satania fan out there because I think he was massively underutilized last year, um, and I think Luke has has got all the potential in the world. But Andrew Armstrong very quietly was one of the better receivers in the conference last year, at least among the returning guys this year. Um, I don't think he gets near enough love uh, from a more even a regional standpoint. Like I think people in Arkansas know he was good, uh, but I think people outside, even in the rest of the SEC, don't realize just how good he was. So I think it's going to be Andrew Armstrong. I just think he's really dependable and can can do it all. Uh, I think he's going to be a a really you know I think he had like seven hundred something receiving yards last year. Um, I don't know if he's going to get to a thousand because I think it's going to be distributed out but pretty good but i could see him having another seven eight hundred yard uh season like he did last year Ooh, uh yeah I, i'm with you I'm, i say i'm going andrew armstrong as well that's my pick we're on the same page here i say oof because i think he has to get to a thousand yards like if not then this passing game is not going to be as good as we think it will be and yeah it'll be it'll get distributed but an elite passing game, you get at least one guy that gets over a thousand yards. And I don't think that there's like the passing is going to be shared between him, Satania, Broden and Haas. And we just talked about CJ Brown's potential, but I really do think like those four guys are going to get the bulk of the targets. And uh, one of them should be able to cross the thousand yard threshold. Uh, I will give a, a shameless plug to a story I wrote yesterday or got published yesterday. I did some bold predictions and I'm, you know, I don't, I it, bold is the key word here, not smart, but I think Luke Haas could lead the entire country among tight ends and receiving yards. Um, you know, if you take his yards per game through the first four games last year before he got hurt, then extrapolate that over the whole season, he would have been second nationally, you know, ahead of Brock Bowers and just behind a, a tight end from Colorado State whose name is uh, leaving me at the moment. But yeah, I, I think that this, the, the receivers for me, like I, I have some faith in them, but they still, I got to, I will really need to see it, you know, happen before I'm like saying, Oh, this is a strong talented room because one thing I keep coming back to with this team is I don't know how much NFL talent is there compared to the rest of the sec. And I think the receiver room is a, is a great, you know, kind of microcosm of that because I think a lot of Arkansas fans believe they have a great receiver room. And then you look at it compared to other league rivals and just, talent wise NFL evaluations it's it doesn't quite match up but you know any of these guys could have a monster year and turn themselves into NFL draft picks and uh, I think you're right Andrew Armstrong is just going to be a consistent presence this year um but hey I, I, Tyrone Broden's the one with all the hype coming out of the kind of spring in the fall so that's a good sign for the Arkansas okay Hutch uh all, we probably maybe we've already mentioned this guy maybe not uh Let's get some some MVP talk. Who is going to be the offensive MVP of this team this year? And you can't say Bobby Petrino. It has to be a player. <laughs> well, it's obviously Bobby Petrino. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll go with the guy who's going to be an extension of Bobby Petrino, the easy pick. If you're going to be any good at all this year, your offensive MVP needs to be Taylor Green. Um, I don't know if he will be, but I'll, I'll be optimistic here for the sake of this conversation and say it's going to be Taylor Green. I think between what he does with his arm, which I'm still a little bit worried about in terms of accuracy and everything, um, I still have confidence that Bobby Petrino is going to get it all figured out. Um, but, you know, with what he can do in the run game, 
I think that I think he's going to be your offensive MVP. He's going to be better than maybe uh, the national people think he's going to be. Uh, is he going to be as good as maybe some Arkansas fans are hoping he'll be? You know, that time will tell. But uh, I, I do think he's going to be the guy that, that makes this offense go. I think the the cool thing about Taylor for Arkansas fans is he's got another year of eligibility. So you would, you know, if he blows up this year and turns himself into an NFL draft pick, great. You've had a tremendous year and, you know, what a incredible win in the transfer portal. If he, you know, has a good year as the offensive MVP, maybe not what Arkansas fans, you know, think he could be, doesn't quite get to that ceiling. He could still come back and improve upon this season and, you know, have an even better season next year. So that's a great shout. Um, I'll give two answers. Uh, one, the real answer is Lou Cause. I just talked about him. You know, right? if he's the nation's leader in receiving yards as a tight end, I think he's the, the MVP of the offense. So I got to stick with that. But uh, in an ideal world for Arkansas, I think the I think the MVP is Fernando Carmona. I, and you know, and he sets the tone, and the entire offensive line improves with him leading the way. I'm not super confident that's going to be the case. Uh, I think Carmona's had a lot of, you know, height, but there's been some, you know, grumblings from coaches that he needs to do better blocking Landon Jackson recently. So that's giving me some pause, but uh, I, I think Carmona's got potential to be that kind of guy. And if he is the offensive MVP, incredible news for Arkansas. That means Taylor's going to be better. Jaquindon's going to be better. Luke's going to be better. It'll be, it'll be fascinating for, for Arkansas. Um, I didn't have this question in our, in what I sent you, but, out of the offensive line, who like which starter do you think has the most pressure on them? Is it Carmona or is there another guy along that front that you think is kind of the biggest pressure question mark, like the the biggest maybe, you know, variable for this team? I think it's Carmona. I mean, I just think there's when you factor in the hype that's on him and you know, he's he's making that jump from San Jose State to the SEC, uh playing the premier position at left tackle. Uh, that's that's a lot of pressure you know especially on a unit that really struggled last year Uh, so I would say he's probably got the most pressure on him Uh, although I think Addison Nichols is another guy um, that that's you know he's he was a guy I think he was a four-star recruit had all his hype coming out of high school didn't really pan out at at Tennessee and now here he is trying to, to make it work again so I mean he's he's right there as well that's another very critical position. I think even Sam Pittman would maybe argue that that center is more of a critical position than left tackle just because he's, you know, touching the ball every play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And center, I think might've been one of the bigger weaknesses last year. I know, you know, Bo Limmer making the shift from guard. I think it just, I, I guess he's playing center now at the NFL, but for whatever reason, that shift didn't work out how they expected. And I think that there's a lot more than just Bo that went into it. It was his relationship with the quarterback. You know, it was his relationship with the rest of the offensive linemen. But there were communication issues up front last year. And uh, I'm with you. I think Sam would say if, if Addison Nichols is the best offensive lineman, then that's a good thing for Arkansas because it'll impact the rest of that unit. Okay, uh, defensive MVP, Hutch, who are you going with here? And uh, I will allow you to say Landon Jackson, uh, <laughs> if that's your answer, just because I, I think it's it's obvious and it's uh, it's uh he's the best player on the defense, but who are you going with? I think it's Landon Jackson. For all those reasons you just said, I think he's going to have a, a really good year. Um, is he going to play his way into a first-round draft pick like some fans think? I mean, maybe. Uh, I'm not counting on that, but I mean, if he could play himself into the top half of the NFL draft, I think that would be really good news for Arkansas. That probably means he was a lot more consistent than he was last year. Uh, I think that would be huge. I mean, just also from a leadership standpoint, he seems to have really become a really strong leader for that defense. And if your leaders are also your best player, that typically bodes well for you. So I'll, I'll, I'll say him, but I will give a shout out. Uh, to Jalen Braxton. I'm a big Jalen Braxton fan. I thought he was excellent last year as a freshman. I'm very anxious to see kind of what he evolves into this year, uh, kind of taking over for Dwight McLeathern as like the shutdown top corner going up against the other team's best receivers. Um, if, if he's up for it, I think that because he's going to be going up against the other team's best receivers, uh, definitely has the chance to be kind of a guy deems defensive MVP. 
Yeah, I agree. With everything you said, it's Landon. Jalen deserves a shout. Um, I would even maybe suggest Cam Ball des deserves a shout. Um, it depends on kind of your definition of MVP. Uh, I know a lot of times us, us, you know, sports reporters, the public, the media, we debate like, is it the best player or is it the most valuable player? And I think Landon could be the best player, but maybe Cam Ball is the most valuable, just bringing that impact uh, in the middle. And, you know, I think Arkansas is a little, a little deeper at defensive end than they are at defensive tackle. So um, Cam Ball would be my give him a shout guy, but it's Landon. I mean, I think, I think he's going to have a monster, monster year this year. And uh, yeah, it's all about the consistency. Like you said, I, I mean, he seven of the eight SEC games last year, he didn't record a sack, which, you know, uh, there's a reason that he was preseason all SEC. And there's a reason that people think he's a uh, projected to be a top draft pick. But uh, he's got to show that every single Saturday this fall and not just, you know, that one time against Alabama. So, all right, Hutch, let's get to the good stuff here. Um, final two slash two and a half questions. The final record. What is Arkansas's 2024 record? Without explaining too much, because it will go into my next answer. Um, I'm going to go <laughs> I'm going to go with five and seven. Uh, okay. I said, I told you, I told other people, I told my boss, like, Hey, if I, if, if I go to write my season predictions piece and I have them going six and six and making a bowl game slap me because I'm like, <laughs> do not get sucked into the optimism that comes with as the season approaches. So I'm going to stick with that. And if they exceed those expectations, then great. That means it's been a fun year to cover. They're getting to go to a bowl game, which means I get to go to a bowl game. Um, and that would just be really fun. Uh, but realistically, the schedule that they've got, I think five and seven is kind of where I'm sitting. You know, maybe before I was worried about another four and eight repeat, but uh, I've been drinking the Bobby Petrino Kool Aid and think that the offense is going to be massively improved. Um, and, you know, I think the defense is going to be solid, but just it's going to be tough to find wins on that schedule. So I'll, I'll go with five and seven. If I if they if this team had last year's schedule, I would predict seven and five. I was thinking about this a little bit last night, trying to come up because I'm gonna sit down and write my game by game predictions uh, later today. So if this team had last year's schedule, I would say seven and five, but I'm gonna say six and six. Um, I and it was closer debating six and six with five and seven than seven and five for me. I think this team is going to. It's going to be difficult to get to six and six and get a bowl game, but I think just you know they won four games last year. I think this team is good enough to add two more wins to the ledger. I think Bobby, it really this team's success, and it's crazy to say this, but I think it comes down to how much you believe in Bobby Petrino and the coaching staff as a whole maximizing the sum of its parts. And I think the defensive staff can do that. I'm, you know, Travis Williams, Marcus Woodson, Deke Adams. I think they have a really good defensive staff. The offensive staff, it remains to be seen. I have faith in Bobby Petrino. I'm worried about the offensive line, but I still think that Petrino, Pittman getting more involved with the offensive line can only help, I think. I think Mateos is an upgrade at the, you know, the offensive line coaching spot. I think they get two wins. I have no idea how they get that sixth win. That's going to be something that I have to stress about when I'm doing these predictions is, okay, what is that sixth win? But uh, yeah, six and six, a bowl game is my prediction. And with that, Hutch, does Sam Pittman keep his job through the season and into 2025 based on your prediction of five and seven? And I'll answer based on my prediction of six and six later. I don't think so. Um, I, I just, if, if it goes the way I think it's going to go, it's just a really tough start of the season. You know, they're going to have a pretty rough record. Uh, what I'm kind of leaning toward is kind of like my bold prediction is that they're at a point when that second bye week comes, which is in November and, you know, Sam Pittman's record is going to be not very good. It's going to dip below that 500 threshold where the buyout drops because uh, you remember his buyouts, you know, he's owed 75% of what uh, is remaining on his contract. If he's above 500, you know, with his record, not including 2020. And if it dips to below 500, then it's 50%. So that's a pretty sizable chunk uh, uh, difference there. So I think 
at that second bye week, there's going to be some sort of announcement, whether that be Sam Pittman announcing he's going to retire or, you know, move on or whatever, or uh, Arkansas could announce that Sam Pittman's not going to be retained. But I don't believe we're going to get interim coach Bobby Petrino, like I know a lot of Arkansas fans are are thinking is going to happen. I, I think they're going to give Sam Pittman the Ed Orgeron treatment where he gets to finish out the season. I think Sam Pittman has earned that right. Uh, he is beloved by everybody. I mean, everybody, you, you hear it all the time on the you know, ESPN is like, Sam Pittman's a great guy, but blah, 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 blah. And it's that's true. I mean, he's a good guy and people like him. And I think they would let him finish out the season. And that kind of leads me to, to my last prediction is that if that is the case, if he is an interim coach or if he is going to get finish out the season as the coach without you know being retained, I think that means Arkansas is going to pull off an upset late in the year. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I'm leaning toward shocking the world and beating Texas just because it's Texas. It's at home. It would be right after that announcement. It's the first game after that bye week. Uh, they could come out emotionally charged and, and, and pull it off. That would be one hell of a story. Um, but I also could see them, you know, maybe being competitive against Texas, not winning it. And then for Sam Pittman's final game, you know, they're out there. There's no chance of making a bowl game. Uh, to go up to Missouri and some wreak some havoc, you know, maybe, maybe take, take up their half of the, you know, the rivalry and, and actually, you know, win a game uh, and, and beat Drinkwitz and all those guys. I think that would be uh, also a possibility. I, I, that's, I, the, one of my five wins is, is going to be Texas or Missouri. Haven't a hundred percent decided that I'll eventually do that when I sit down and write out my predictions. Uh, but I think if, if it plays out, like I think with Sam Pittman being kind of, kept on to finish the year, they're going to pull off an upset that they probably have no business pulling off. Interesting. I got a lot of thoughts on that. Um, and I'll get to my prediction a bit later, but what kind of related to that, I, I wonder what the con, like what in your, in that scenario that you just laid out for us, like is, is five and before, hold on, I'm kind of rambling here. Cause you've, you've uh, put me in th- through me for a loop. Is five and seven, does that put him below 500, uh, excluding the COVID year? I believe so. Uh, but I also think that they would agree to whatever the buyout is during that bye week. So, like, regardless of what happens, again, so like if they actually beat Texas and Missouri or something, they would maybe okay. go above it. But I think that that's going to be the, the situation they're in. Uh, let's see. What is is there three games after this? Is it like Texas, Louisiana Tech, Missouri after the bye week? Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe they're two and or three and six. I guess is what they would be, and then maybe they yeah. are four and four and seven. Or uh, my math is four. And no, five. three and six. If, if they if they're three and six, and then they win one of those upsets, and beat Louisiana Tech, you get to yeah. the five and seven. Yeah, that's that's kind of what um, I was thinking. Me- I like, I mean, I like what you're saying, but at the same time, it goes, it does go against a little bit of what, you know, Sam has kind of said of like, I'm not ready to retire or anything. And if, if that, you know, he can always have a change of heart. Um, He could maybe get pushed out and we are, you know, framing it as this, but in order for that to happen, I think, you know, Sam would have to agree to, um, yeah, I'll take less money uh, before the season's over, you know, like, because he could go, by that scenario, if he's uh, three and six, and they go three and zero oh to close the season, then all of a sudden he's above that five hundred threshold, and it's like, oh, why did I agree to taking you know the fifty percent of the buyout instead of the seventy five? So, um, it's it's interesting. I think Arkansas fans would like that scenario because I know a lot of them are kind of ready for the Sam Pittman tenure to be over, and that would be a nice clean close to it. Um, an amicable breakup and arc it would give Arkansas an ample amount of time to look for the the successor if they did make that announcement during the bye week um I just maybe I'm a little bit skeptical that Sam's gonna agree to turn down 25 percent of his buyout before you know the final results are in but who knows we'll see uh so by my logic I guess six and six I guess the answer is yes he stays much right like like if you if they go six and six, he stays, right? You agree with yeah, that? I think if they make a bowl game, he's he's safe and he's back. Yeah. So I guess then I have to say he's back. Uh, but one, and I think I the one thing that maybe you and I are, um, you know, six and six, five and seven are very close. But I think where 
very different on is I think Arkansas's best chance for success comes early in the season. And whereas I think you think that they maybe can turn it around at the end. Um, but I think if they're going to get to six wins, like they probably have to win two of those, you know, first four tough games that are Tennessee, Oklahoma State, Auburn, uh, whom, and um, A&M. A&M, yeah. Uh, where, and then I, where, so if, if that happens, then there's not, you know, if they have a good start to the season, then there's, you know, Sam's not going to, uh, agree to leave or get fired early. It's going to let's play it out. So, but I'm with you. I think we both agree that there's there's not going to be an interim Bobby Petrino this year. And to be honest, there should not be an interim head coach this year because I think that would be a slap in the face to the Arkansas fans of bringing Sam back for this season only to fire him mid season. Um, it would just be like a waste of a year, and it would be an admission like. We just didn't have the money to fire him until that clause got below 50%. And maybe that is the case, but you got to wait until the season's over to do that. And all the, all the kind of the results are on the table and you can look at everything with a clear picture. Otherwise it's like, what, what were we doing this year? It was just, it was just a waste and in every, in every fashion. So uh, man, six and six, five and seven. I think there's going to be a lot of intrigue uh, despite maybe some uh, low expectations for the for the Arkansas football team this year which is good and hey like you said we the the bar is low for this team to have some excitement right like if they're if they're 6 and 5 going to Missouri uh <laughs> that's going to feel like a, a complete success and you know they've got only you know they can really put a bow on the season even if they're 5 and 6 going to Missouri uh there'll there'll be a lot of pressure on that game but there's going, there's going to be intrigue one way or the other, just based off how last season went and uh, kind of all the hot seat grumblings that are that are going on with the program right now. How do you think Sam's handling this? You know, he had a, a good tone at the Little Rock Touchdown Club the other day. He's been, you know, I think he was worn down by the end of last year talking to us. I think he's been pretty good uh, with us in media availability. How do you think Sam's handling this this pressure right now? I think he's handling it pretty good. I mean, all things considered, I know, you know, he's, I think he said this before, and I believe it when he says it is, you know, he's not really worried about his job this year. He's worried about everyone else in the building. And I, I do think that that maybe is one uh, aspect to my bold prediction that may throw a wrench into it too, is like, you know, why would he step down if he's worried about all these other people's jobs? Um, and I recognize that, you know, I'm just trying to got to make a bold prediction somewhere. Um, and I'm not <laughs> about to pick them to go nine and three or anything. So what? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I think he's handling it okay. You know, I've, I've actually I've, I've talked to some people that maybe are closer to Sam Pittman, and they they indicate that he feels pretty good about this team. Which you could say that you know, oh well, that's just him every time. But like he's he's been pretty honest with these people. You know, maybe they weren't he wasn't super confident going into twenty twenty his first season, but then twenty twenty one he was like, hey, I think we're going to be pretty good, and sure enough, they were really good. So. Um, I think he's got some confidence, and I think it's genuine confidence. Uh, maybe that changes week two against Oklahoma State. I think that's probably the most critical game of the year, but I think he's handling it okay. I agree. Uh, and, you know, last year, of course, he had confidence. He had KJ and Rocket back and two all, you know, two strong offensive linemen and, you know, a, a defensive staff overhaul that he believed in, and rightfully so. Uh, it makes sense that last year's struggles were a surprise, you know? Um, and I, I believe him when he says he's got confidence in this team. Uh, the problem is he's playing in the SEC and being a, being a good football team in the SEC is being average to below average. You have to be a great football team to win more than seven games in this conference. And I don't think they're quite there yet with the talent, but they took some strides this off season. And uh, I think, they made some really smart staff changes and we'll see this is why this is why they play the games on the field and why we're so excited to to make the trip to little rock uh maybe not that excited about that but we're excited the football season is here so we'll wrap up there hutch uh 50 minutes good preview talk uh get me a little bit more and for the season hope that same goes for the listeners uh thank you all so much for listening and tuning in uh, our 
viewership is really, really slowly, slowly, but surely uh, getting bigger. We appreciate that. Be sure to read all of Hutch's stuff at bestofarkansasports.com and my stuff as well at swtimes.com. Um, we'll have you covered all season on the hog. So thank you so much for listening, Hutch. I will talk to you soon and everybody have a great rest of your week.